Hello, and welcome to this study on how Satan deceives mankind. This series is not intended to be an exhaustive study on Satan. Instead, it's going to focus on one primary method that he uses to attack mankind today. Specifically, we're going to look at how he deceived Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And now before you sit back and say, hold on, wait a minute, I'm not interested in what went on thousands and thousands of years ago. I want to know what's going on today and what affects my life today. It's a fair statement. It's a, it's a good thought. Understand this. The exact same approach that Satan used on Adam and Eve thousands of years ago, he is using on you and me and millions of other people today. And he is doing it with great success. We need to understand what is going on. We need to understand what he is doing. God tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, he says, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, we should not be ignorant of his devices. You need to know what your enemy is doing. You need to know the plan that your enemy has to come against you and attack you. So God says, Lest Satan should get an advantage over you, you should not be ignorant of what he is doing. So in this series, we are going to examine three things. Number one, we're going to look at Satan's primary target. And again, I'm talking about primary here, and I want to emphasize right from the beginning, this is not the only way that Satan attacks us. By no means. We could go on for hours and hours and hours. We're looking at the primary method that he uses. He comes at us whatever avenue he can come at us with to get success. But we're going to look at the primary one. So we're going to examine, number one, his primary target. Secondly, we're going to look at the primary or major weapons that he uses to attack us. And then, of most importance, we're going to look at the weapons that we have or the defenses that we have to stand against him. First, let's look at what is Satan's primary purpose. Now, without going into a long, long history of Satan and who he is, um, he was a created angel, is a created angel, he's a created being. He's not God, he's not omnipotent or omniscient like God, he's not all-powerful like God. He is a created being. And sometime in, in time past, uh, pride filled him and he rebelled against God. He was in heaven, again a created angel, and for whatever reasons that were in him, he wanted to rebel against God. He wanted to be God himself. He wanted to be worshipped like the God. And so God took him and threw him out of heaven. He lost his perfection because he sinned and rebelled against God. So now, in really a capsule form, Satan stands as the enemy of God. So his primary purpose is to stand against or to oppose anything that reflects or represents God. Secondly, he wants to stand against mankind. Why? Because man is God's creation. Originally, it was God's perfect creation, and God loves man. Just like the angels were created by God and were perfect when they were created, so man was created by God and was perfect when he was created. And as I said, God loves him. So if Satan can fight man and get man to fall and to keep man away from God, he in turn hurts God because God loves man. And then third, his overall purpose is to be worshipped. He wants to be worshipped like God is worshipped because he thinks he is that powerful. He thinks he is that worthy that he ought to be worshipped. We're going to look uh, specifically now how he strikes out at mankind and how and therefore he strikes out against God. We're going to look at Adam and Eve because there he creates, God has his perfect creation, man as I just said, so he goes and attacks. A couple of other examples, when you had Jesus Christ was here. Here he is, God in the flesh. Again, perfect humanity. You have deity taking on humanity. What does Satan do with Christ? Remember when Christ fasts 40 days and he goes out into the wilderness? Satan comes and tempts him. He tempted him three times. But what was he trying to do? At his last temptation, he took him up into the mountain. He showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And he says, I'll give you all of this if you will bow down and worship me. He's trying to get God's perfect son to rebel against God and to worship him so that he becomes the king, if we can put it that way. And now he stands against man now. Christ did not fall for that, and he didn't rebel. But as we said before, Satan continues to fight against man. He attacked man in the Garden of Eden, and he won. He deceived him, and he won. 
he continues to attack man today. Why? Because when mankind fell, he lost fellowship with God. He came under the sentence of death, spiritual death, physical death, and now he is separated from God, and his eternal destiny is hell. Now you have Jesus Christ comes here, and through Jesus Christ and his death on the cross, he provides redemption for mankind. If man will believe in him and trust in him and ask for that salvation from God, his sins can be forgiven, fellowship can be restored with God, and man can ultimately spend eternity in heaven with God. That's what Satan doesn't want. Because he knows God loves man, for God so loved the world, he gave us his only begotten son. His way to fight against God is to keep mankind from receiving that free gift of salvation so that ultimately they will be restored to God and they can spend eternity in heaven. Listen to what he says here. Listen to what God tells us. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verses 3 and 4. But if our gospel be hidden, that's the message of salvation, of what we just talked about. If our gospel be hidden, it is hidden to them that are lost, in whom the God of this age, that's Satan, has blinded the minds of them who believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. You see how he continues to attack mankind today. Keep them away. Here's the gospel. Here's the only true saving gospel that will bring you back into fellowship with God. He blinds people's eyes to that so that they cannot see it, so that they can't understand it. And it takes only the power of God to remove that blindness. But that's how he continues to resist, how he continues to attack. So God sends us a warning. I mean, this is a powerful thing here, very powerful. God sends a warning to us, 1 Peter 5.8. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, he says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, like a roaring lion, walks about, seeking whom he may devour. Here's Satan on the prowl. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, like a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. This is a powerful verse, and I think one that deserves our, our time to just break it down word by word. We'll do it quickly, but we need to look at each word here. Number one, he says, be sober. To be sober means to be in control of your mind. Be in control of the way that you think. Maintain the ability to look at reality clearly and to really be able to see what is going on. Now, when we hear be sober, uh, the natural comparison comes to our mind is don't be drunk, don't be intoxicated. Now, God isn't literally referring to don't being intoxicated here, although he doesn't want us to be. But the comparison is legitimate. When a person is intoxicated, they're not in control of their mind. They're not in control of the way that they are thinking. We all know someone who is drunk. They do things that they wouldn't normally do. They don't make rational decisions. More often than not, they make very stupid decisions, and decisions that get them into a whole lot of trouble. They're not able to control their thinking. Oftentimes, if they're intoxicated enough, they can't even control themselves physically. They're stumbling and falling all over the place. So the idea is here, even removed from alcoholic beverages is be in control of your mind be able to think clearly be sober be vigilant be vigilant means be awake be watchful be on your guard be ready to respond to any attack don't get caught sleeping or drowsing or letting your mind wander so he says be sober be vigilant why because your adversary the word adversary means opponent one who stands against you. It was used very often in a court of law. You had your adversary, you had the person who was standing on the other side of you fighting against you in the court of law. It's someone who's working against you. Your adversary, and he identifies him, the devil. A lot of words used for Satan in scripture. The one used here is diabolos. This means the accuser. The one who stands and accuses you before God. The one who comes and brings false charges against you. You have an adversary. You have an accuser. The one who works against you. And it carries the idea of having a maliciousness or a hostility. So God is saying, look, be sober. Think clearly. Be vigilant. Be awake. Pay attention. Because you have an adversary. Someone who's standing against you who has great malicious hostility against you. 
and he is opposing you. He falsely accuses you before God, and he falsely accuses God before man so that we don't have an accurate picture of God. So your adversary, the devil, here's a further description, like a roaring lion. Picture that lion out there in, in the field who's out there looking for dinner. The roaring, the ferocious beast who's out there and he's filled with hunger. He walks about. That means to walk at large. Satan has freedom to walk this planet. He stood before God at one time and God said to him, where have you been? Where are you coming from? And he says, I've been walking to and fro on the earth. God has free reign here on this planet. He goes where he chooses. So you have this roaring lion, this beast who is on the hunt, walking freely throughout this world, seeking. Seeking means to look intently. He's not just casually meandering around going, hey, what a beautiful day today. He says, oh, look at the trees. Aren't they lovely? No, no, no. He's got his eyes locked on something. Again, think of that lion who's out there stalking his prey. He puts himself out there and he's looking for the weakest one that's out there. And he's looking and he's looking intently and when he finds him, he's looking all around and then boom, he locks his eyes on him and he just sets and starts going right towards him. This is a picture of Satan coming after us. So be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, like a roaring lion, walks about seeking what? Whom he may devour. Powerful word here. This word devour comes from the Greek katapinio. And I give you the Greek cell because it breaks into two words and it's powerful. Kata means down and pino means to drink. So you put them together and it means to, to take something and drink it down, to swallow it up, to gulp it, to completely devour it. So go back to your picture of the lion here. And he's out there and he's stalking his prey and he finds it and he grabs onto it and gets it by the throat and chokes it and kills it. Then he spins around and just starts biting into that thing and devouring it. He's gulping out great pieces of flesh and swallowing them down. This is what Satan wants to do to us spiritually. So that's why God says be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, like a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. So we've got an enemy out there. And we, don't, we can't be ignorant of his devices, of his methods of attack, lest he will get an advantage over us. So there's our background. We have an adversary who's looking to hurt us. We have an adversary who's looking to do us great harm. So now we're going to look specifically, we'll begin to start to focus on uh, how Satan attacked Adam and Eve in the garden. And then we're going to be able to break all of that down and see how he's doing the same thing to us today. So the background is God has created Adam and Eve. He's put them into the Garden of Eden, and he's given them everything that is there. He says, all of this you can have, it's all freely yours, there's just one thing I don't want you to do. And rather than me say it, let me read it to you. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 15. And the Lord God took the man, and he put him in the Garden of Eden to till and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now there's the whole setting. God has taken Adam, taken Eve, put him in the Garden of Eden. He's given them everything that they need. They're in paradise. Everything that they need to survive, everything that they can want is all there. He just gives them one restriction, one command. He says, all the trees are here, hundreds, thousands, whatever. They're all yours. You can have whatever you want, just one tree. The one tree that's there, the knowledge of good and evil, don't eat from that tree. And the day that you eat from that tree, you will surely die. This is the command that Satan uses to work his attack on Adam and Eve. So as we begin in, begin in part two, this is where we're going to pick up and we'll start to take this attack that he brings against them and start to break it down piece by piece so that we can relate it to how Satan is attacking us still today. I thank you again for watching and may God bless you.